Once Upon a Time is the way that we began our Christmas series here at Hollywood Community Church about four weeks ago. Our Christmas series has been simply titled A Christmas Tale. And for the past month, we have told the story of a king, not just any king, but we've told the story of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a nursery rhyme. It's not a fable. It's not a work of fiction. It is the story of King Jesus. He is our King. And I trust today that He is your King. Yet, The story of our king is different than the story of any other king. Yes, our king is eternal. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He knows everything, absolutely everything. He's sovereign. No one can replace him, and certainly no one can defeat him. No one could humble him, and all must honor him. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us one day that all of us, every person that has ever lived, will bow before King Jesus and recognize him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Yet here's the amazing thing. Yet he of his own volition, he of his own will, humbled himself and became like one of us. To me, that's the most amazing part of the story. I want to read Luke chapter 2. I think we'll put the verses up on the screen. Luke chapter 2, very familiar passage of Scripture. Luke chapter 2, the first seven verses. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town, or from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Verse 7, very, very familiar verse. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Would you pray with me for just a few moments? Lord, thank you so much for the humility of Jesus Christ. Thank you that he left everything to come to earth. And today we can celebrate Christmas, Lord, not because of us, not because of our goodness, what we've done, what we've made. Lord, we celebrate Christmas because of you. We celebrate Christmas because of the humility of Jesus. So Lord, I pray that in just the the few moments that we have, that we we would understand the depth, the magnitude of his humility then I pray that we would respond to that. I pray that we by faith would respond to that compassionate, gracious, loving humility of Jesus. And then, Lord, that this Christmas we would emulate it. That with our family and friends and neighbors and those around us, that we would be just like Jesus. Thank you for him today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So no one can look at Jesus and say that he was privileged, that he was haughty, that he was arrogant. If, if you would have had the opportunity to personally meet him, you would have sensed that there was something distinct, something different about him. He had an air not of arrogance, but he had an air of humility. From his birth to his death, Without a doubt, he was the living example of humility. You see, in a world that constantly desires to move up, Jesus moved down. Think about that. He was willingly demoted instead of being 
promoted. Who does that? I cannot imagine any of us volunteering to be treated in the way that Jesus was treated. Think with me for just a moment the, the, the magnitude and the depth of his humiliation. You see, Jesus, from one moment to another, transitioned from comfort to discomfort. We read that verse. If we can put verse 7 back up again, uh, guys, verse 7 simply says this. Do we have that there, guys? Verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the end. Notice, notice that. Look at that verse. No, notice what words seem to indicate discomfort instead of comfort. Swaddling cloths. They were, uh, they were cloths that were just tightly wrapped around him. That certainly doesn't seem comfortable to me. A manger. Who, who wants to lay in a, in, in a trough? Because there was no room for him in the end. You see, there's no way that you and I can even begin to imagine the humiliation and the degradation that Jesus experienced when he left heaven, when he came to earth. We call it the advent. When he took upon himself human flesh, the incarnation of Jesus. Many people have lost their wealth. Many people have been stripped of their power. Many people have been embarrassed in public. And others have been humiliated in court. But no one has experienced the magnitude of humiliation that Jesus suffered. From one moment to another, he left the glory of heaven. And he arrived in a stinky, dirty cave surrounded by animals. One moment he was the son of God, and the next moment he was the newborn son of Joseph and Mary. One moment he was the one who never needed anything, and the next he was an infant that needed absolutely everything. Think of this, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but one moment he was completely pure and the next moment, he had a diaper on, or something the equivalent of a diaper that needed to be changed. You see, from one moment to the next, Jesus moved from comfort to discomfort. Think with me, he, he went from being worshipped to being ignored, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3 tells us that there are seraphim that are gathered around the throne of God whose job it is to continually praise him. 24-7 they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see, for, for years and for, for decades and for ages, he had been used to constant, continual praise. But at his birth, Jesus was no longer the center of worship. To his parents, he was a child. To the guests at the inn, he was just another crying baby. To his siblings, he was just the older brother. To the children with whom he would play and interact, he was just a friend. And to the people of Nazareth, he was just the carpenter's son. Little did anyone know that the baby in the manger, the child playing at his father's knee, the carpenter's apprentice, was none other than Almighty God, King of kings, Lord of lords, the very center of the universe, the one who is worthy of our praise. Think about this, he, he went from being in a world of love to all of a sudden being in a world of hate. For, from the moment of his birth, Jesus was immersed into a world filled with hate. The Romans oppressed the Jews, and as a result, the Jews hated the Romans. 
the religious elite despised the poor, and the poor despised the pharisaical attitude of the religious leaders. The world was filled in Jesus' day with oppression, abuse, wars, and rumors of wars. You talk about culture shock, leaving one culture and all of a sudden immersing yourself in another culture. He went from being the source of life to being the recipient of death. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that he humbled himself in such a way that he became like us. And humbled himself, not only becoming a man, but he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of we sit back from our perspective our modern day comfortable lifestyle perspective doing everything we can to get ahead doing everything we can to provide for our kids doing everything we can to experience and enjoy the comforts of life to live as long as we possibly can and we sit back and say why would anyone do that Why would anybody leave the glory, the splendor, the worship, the wealth, all of that of heaven to come here and experience what Jesus experienced? Paul Paul gives us just a little bit of light of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, where Paul says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, notice this phrase, I'm not sure if we have it up there, Yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might be made rich. Do you see that? I want to read that verse again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and and we can talk about the, the wealth of heaven, we can talk about the fact that he was rich in precious stones, that he was rich in mercy, he was rich in all of those things, though he was rich. Yet for your sake, he became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. You say the simple truth is this, and this is the story of Christmas. Jesus came to earth. He became one of us. He went through all the trials and tribulations of earth, experiencing temptation. He was tempted in all points like we are the only difference being without sin. He suffered all of that for you and for me. So, so, so catch this today. Christmas is not about many gifts. I'm not sure how many gifts you have under your tree and how many gifts you're going to give and receive this evening and tomorrow. But Christmas is not about many gifts. It's about one gift. <laughs> one gift that's not wasn't beautifully wrapped, but one gift that was wrapped in rags, but a gift of immeasurable, eternal value. And the question is this, have you accepted by faith the gift of Jesus? You see, the simple truth is that in order for a gift to be ours, we have to receive it. Someone might hand you the most beautifully wrapped, the most elegant, the most expensive gift in the world, but in order for that gift to become yours, you actually have to reach out and take it and appropriate it and claim it as yours. The same thing is true with our relationship with Jesus Christ. God, in his love, in his mercy, by his grace, offers us a gift that we do not, could not ever deserve, and he reaches out. And offers it to us. And we by faith reach out and take it. When we confess our sins, we realize, we recognize our need of him. And by faith, we believe not only who he is or in who he is, but we believe in what he has done for us. Tonight, let me ask you, have you accepted that gift? Has there been a moment in your life when you, by faith, realized who you are and who he is, and you realized that you desperately need him in your life, and you have reached out to Jesus 
as the answer for all of life's struggles and all of life's problems and all of life's temptations and all of life's sins. We must recognize Jesus as our king. Let me say one other thing, challenge you, and I'll be done tonight. To be a follower of the king not only means to recognize Jesus as the king, but to be a follower of the king means to, to the best of our ability, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, to live like the king. Here's, here's two verses that have been our theme verses in 2018 here at Hollywood Community Church. Our theme this year has been live generously, and we're six, seven, eight days away from the end of the year. So let me say it one more time. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition and conceit, but in, notice the same word, in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So tonight and tomorrow and the next few days as we meet together with fans, family and friends, we celebrate this Christmas holiday. How can you and I live like the king? How can we be living representatives of King Jesus? What is the best way to do that? Let me give you three simple ways and I'm done. The first is this, look for ways to serve others. You might sit back and say, hey, Brian, they're just family. They get on my nerves. They aggravate me. Look for ways to serve others. Yeah, yeah, actually, look for ways to love on and serve even those family members that might not be your favorite family members. Even loving on those who might not love you. Because, by the way, that's exactly the way that God loves us. Look for ways to serve others. Look for ways to be generous. Above and beyond what you've already purchased and wrapped and put under the tree, look for ways to be generous. Jesus was generous in everything that he did. He said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Look for ways to be generous. And this might be the most difficult Look for ways to be forgiving. Look for ways to demonstrate forgiveness to those who have aggravated us, to those who have angered us, to those who have offended us. Look for ways to be forgiving. Someone has said that we're never more like Jesus than when we forgive others. And by the way, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.32 to forgive just as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You see, Jesus, when he came, was light in the midst of darkness. There was something about him that was distinct. He was born into a dark culture with darkness all around him. And Jesus shone his light the light of his love, the light of his compassion, the light of the gospel on those around him and his others began to embrace that light. The truth of Christianity, the light of Christianity began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter in the darkness. That's exactly what we have been called to do is Jesus, the light of the world. We are called to share, to reflect his light through our lives into the lives of others. Let's do that this Christmas season.